Hi, this is a continuation of a mod tutorial for Embers Rekindled for 1.12.2. If you're new to Embers Rekindled, go check out my first video on it, as this video will assume you know what I went over in that tutorial. There's a lot of stuff left in the mod, so this tutorial will be split into two parts. In this video, I will cover higher level ember generation, transfer, and storage, as well as transmutation and tools. First, let's talk about ember generation. While the ember activator is fine, there's a higher tier generator called the pressure refinery. This generator requires water to be piped in in order to produce ember. By default, the refinery produces 1.5 times the amount of ember an ember activator would. However, if you place a metal block surrounded by lava, the multiplier can reach up to three times. To demonstrate, here we see one crystal generates 1600 ember, while with the other refinery, it generates 7200. What type of block determines the multiplier? Gold, silver, copper, and electrum give a 3 times multiplier. Nickel, tin, and aluminum give a 2.85 times multiplier. And finally, iron, bronze, and lead give a 2.62 multiplier. Outside of these blocks, the multiplier defaults to 1.5 times. The higher ember yield and dependence on water make this refinery synergize well with mini boilers powering mechanical pumps. More ember production calls for a higher throughput transfer. This can be done with the ember ejectors and ember funnels. These transfer a large amount of ember. Note, while it isn't required to pair ejectors with funnels, using an ejector with a receptor will cause an ember loss, as the receptor can't hold the whole ember pulse. Secondly, with this large amount of ember being moved, you may want to split the ember being produced to power multiple machines. To do this, you use a beam splitter. The beam splitter has two faces that receive ember and two faces that eject ember. The faces of the larger ports sticking out act as emitters and the smaller ports act as receivers. Ember is split and output evenly between the two emitters. Finally, all this production and transfer calls for a better storage. That's where the crystal cell comes in. The crystal cell is special in that the amount it stores can be increased by feeding it ember crystals. By default, it has a storage of 64,000 ember. Ember crystals increase capacity by 24,000 and ember shards increase it by 4,000. The more ember stored, the larger the crystal floating above gets. The crystal cell caps at 1,440,000 ember, which takes 58 ember crystals. Let's get into alchemy and transmutations. Before diving into that, we need some precursory knowledge. First off, alchemy requires ash. To get that, all you have to do is place or pipe any items into a cinder plinth, and then power it with ember. It will cook the item and turn it into ash. The ash will then drop into the world unless you have a bin underneath it. The next things you need for alchemy are a spectus. To get a spectus, you need to use a stamper. But before we get into that, I'd like to mention the clockwork attenuator, a useful dial which, when given a redstone signal, regulates the speed the machine they're attached to work. By default, it's set to work at zero time speed, and in other words, it will disable the machine when given a signal. If you want to change the speed while it's powered or unpowered, put it in the desired state and right-click to increase the speed, and shift-right-click to lower it. For example, if I only want the machine to work when I pull this lever, I just shift-right-click until it's lower, pull the lever, and right-click it until it's at one times. Now onto Aspectus. Aspectus are all made the same way, but with different metals. You just place an ember shard into a stamp base that has the middle of the aspectus you want, and then put a plate stamp on the stamper. Once we have everything in place, thanks to the attenuator, we just flip this lever on and it will stamp and give us a copper aspectus. With that out of the way, we can get into the actual transmutation process. First off, you need NEI or JEI to know transmutation recipes, as there's no in-game way to find out. Transmutation requires three things, an exchange tablet, at least one alchemy pedestal, and a beam cannon. The exchange tablet is where you place a recipe for the transmutation. For example, to create soul sand, you need sand on all four sides and ash at the center. To do that, just right click the tablet on each of the four sides with sand. Note, while excess materials aren't burned in the transmutation process, for the sake of completing the recipe, the easiest way to place items is to do it one by one, then just place the center item of the recipe on the top. 
Next for our soul sand recipe, NEI calls for a copper aspectus and 10 to 16 ash. What that means is you need to place a copper aspectus in a nearby alchemy pedestal and then put in somewhere between 10 and 16 ash in the pedestal, which again is done by just right clicking the ash onto the top part. Finally, the beam cannon uses ember so that when given a redstone signal, it shoots out a laser pure ember energy. It does a large amount of damage, but its primary purpose is to initiate transmutations. Only one particular amount of ash is correct, and should you get the wrong amount, you will get alchemical waste. The alchemical waste will tell you how far off you are. You can also place the alchemical waste in the stamper with a flat stamp and no molten metal to get some ash back. Since 10 ash gave us alchemical waste that says the copper was off by 4, we can be certain that 14 is the required amount. So I'll just place it and start the process again. If you care to, you could also pipe everything in, but transmutation is a very precise thing and isn't meant to be automated. Other recipes may require multiple aspectus and sometimes even different amounts of ash for the aspectus. Now we have four soul sand from four sand. The most ideal setup for transmutation should look something like this, since any nearby aspectus are ignored if no ash is put into their pedestal. Here are some things you can get through transmutation. Adhesive is just a simple recipe item meant to conveniently replace slime balls. The glimmer crystal is an item which allows you to place light sources. Doing this uses durability, but staying in the light will slowly repair the glimmer crystal. It can be crafted to get the glimmer lamp, which shoots light out as a projectile and places it. The glimmer lamp also uses up durability every time you create light. Metallurgic dust converts veins of ore into another random type by right-clicking. However, there is a chance to turn the ore you're clicking into a plain stone block. Ember crystal clusters are used for crafting the more advanced things in embers. Here, I have a field chart. The field chart acts similarly to an atmospheric gauge as it measures ember levels, but instead maps out the levels of the surrounding area. Brighter and elevated areas have high ember and the center bright square is where the chart is currently placed. Transmutation adds various equipment as well, which I will now get into, along with the tools. Before getting into the tools themselves, you'll need to craft yourself mantle pieces, such as the mantle bauble, the mantle jar, and the mantle cartridge. These act as ember batteries to power the tools added in the mod. The mantle bauble holds the lease, but can power items from your inventory or bauble slot. The mantle jar just needs to be in your inventory, and the mantle cartridge holds the most, but you must hold it in your offhand. With that done, you'll need a way to charge the mantle pieces. To charge anything that stores ember, you use the copper charger. Just feed it ember and anything you put in there will be charged. You can use this method to also transfer large amounts of ember quickly by using the copper charger in combination with the ember siphon. The ember siphon drains ember from adjacent blocks, allowing you to transfer it to wherever you like. Now onto the tools and armor added. Embers add 7 baubles, an armor set, and 6 tools. To name them all, there are the 3 ember baubles, the ashen amulet, the amulet of the heretic, dawnstone mail, and the explosion amulet. The armor is made up from ashen goggles, ashen cloak, ashen leggings, and ashen boots. The six tools are the tearfing, cinder staff, blazing ray, clockwork pickaxe, clockwork battle axe, and grand hammer. With the exception of the tearfing, all of the tools require ember to function and will also very temporarily light the mobs on fire. I will now go over what the tools do and how they function. First off, we have the tearfing. While it only has a base damage of 4 points, it does more damage against armored targets. The Cinder Staff shoots what is basically a fireball. To do this, just hold right click and you will begin to charge a fireball. The longer you charge it, the larger the AoE, the higher the damage, and the further the projectile will go. Regardless of how strong the fireball is, it will always consume 25 ember. The blazing ray shoots out ember energy like a laser. It is very long range, and unlike the cinder staff, charging it does not increase damage, but instead increases the accuracy. Just like the cinder staff, however, it consumes 25 ember regardless of how long you hold the charge.
The Clockwork Pickaxe has a relatively fast mining speed and acts as both a shovel and a pick. It also can be used as a weapon that deals 7 damage, which is equivalent to a diamond sword. Breaking a block or attacking costs 5 ember. The Clockwork Battle Axe acts as an axe and a weapon. It breaks wood very quickly and does 9 damage to mobs. Breaking a block or attacking costs 5 ember. The Grand Hammer is mainly a weapon that doubles as an all-purpose block destroyer. It does 11 damage and can break most blocks. However, it does not harvest any blocks, so anything you break with it is deleted. Breaking a block or attacking costs 5 ember. Now let's get into baubles and armor. Embers adds Ashen Armor. It provides 18 armor points, which is nearly as strong as diamond armor, and it looks pretty neat. The Ashen Goggles will allow you to see information as if you were using a Tinker's Lens. The Ashen Cloak can reduce specific types of damage when used with an Inflictor Gem. The Inflictor Gem records the damage type taken when you hold it. Here I'll take damage from a Splash Potion of Harming while holding it. Once you do that, you can then put it in a crafting table along with a piece of string and your Ashen Cloak. Once crafted together, wearing the full suit provides roughly 33% resistance to that damage type. You can remove Inflictor Gems by putting the cloak in a crafting table. You can also apply multiple gems at the same time, but only at once. To do this, just put multiple Inflictor Gems with the Ashen Cloak in the recipe. By doing this, you can become outright immune to certain types of damage. These are the Ember Ring, Ember Amulet, and Ember Belt. They will all reduce the amount of Ember spent by equipment. Individually, they reduce it by different amounts, with the Ember Ring reducing the least, and the Ember Belt reducing the cost the most. They stack additively, and with two rings in the Amulet and Belt, it reduces Ember cost by roughly 75%. The Amulet of the Heretic reduces damage from magic-like potions of harming by 90%. Here I have a dispenser stocked with Harming Tooth Splash Potions. They should do 6 hearts of damage, but thanks to the amulet, it only deals half a heart. The amulet of the heretic cannot make you immune to magic damage, and will only reduce damage to a minimum of half a heart. The ashen amulet causes mobs to only drop ash when killed. Dawnstone Mail makes you completely immune to knockback when worn in the bauble's chest slot. The Explosion Charm completely nullifies nearby explosions. It can also be crafted into an Explosion Charm pedestal, which nullifies explosions that happens within roughly 7 blocks of the pedestal. Explosion Charms are extremely potent, and to demonstrate that, I'm going to create a wither inside this glass box. Perfectly safe. And that will do it for part 1. In part 2, I will cover smithing, augments, and wrap up with any other advanced mod stuff I failed to mention. Thanks for watching.